we talked a little bit about and will continue to your investigations and prevention. And I think that, as, as Maura mentioned, there are instances when it is criminal, uh, when it's a threat, criminal harassment, stalking, et cetera. And part of what your job will be, whether we pass this bullying statute or not, I think is to focus on do you play a role as a criminal investigator? You may not know until you look at the facts, but it's important for you and for those assistant district attorneys you work with or our office to get a clear idea, not just from your sense, and don't forget your common sense, but does this behavior, even though it's wrong or harassing, um, reach to the level of a criminal charge? And I think it's important um, that we be clear on that going forward. Uh, we want you to think about the tools that you have, and we hope to encourage you as you go forward. If you have a situation, you think it requires a response, you're not sure what it is, um, to talk to us about it, because we want to work with you to be clear on the law and to be fair and to find the best tools that you can use. Um, we know, for instance, that D.A. Scheibel bought criminal harassment and civil rights charges against the students. Um, and I think we, and I know your district attorneys and the ADAs you work with, both in juvenile uh, and otherwise, will be there to help you if you believe something should be charged. I think it's important that we don't overcharge, uh, but that we be creative on ways in which the law can apply to keep kids safe. I believe, for instance, that if we do have a culture change, schools recognize that sooner you work as a school resource officer or otherwise to defuse a situation, that we are better off. And I think that's got to be part of our focus also, to address this behavior before it becomes criminal. But if we do not, then we need to think about ways in which we use the juvenile system as we do now for <laughs> correction, for keeping kids safe, and for addressing the behavior of those who would bully. So what are the things that we need to as we move forward. Um, I don't believe the criminal law is the only solution to this. It never is to a problem that is complicated. Uh, that's why this training today includes a variety of um, tactics that you may use, and it, <clears throat> I'm gonna introduce in a minute uh, our speaker this morning so you can understand a little bit more uh, of the behavior. I think it's important that you weigh in and pay attention to the bullying legislation It goes forward and understand what your role will be um, and what you can do to make sure that it's implemented in your schools. Um, and as I said when I started, uh, I think that the biggest uh, tool you bring to this is your common sense. The training you got as a police officer and the experience you have working in your communities um, to keep that common sense about uh, how we approach this problem and how you can be helpful both to prevent and to address it uh, when it becomes too dangerous. And so um, I'd like next to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Englander. Uh, she is the founder and director of the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center at Bridgewater State College. She's a nationally known expert with a wealth of experience and knowledge um, that she's gonna share with us in a minute. Uh, she has a longer biography if you're interested in your materials, but I'd rather have uh, her have time telling you about what she knows and you can look about uh, her background. Um, I just want to mention that we're pleased to have her back with us here today because when I was district attorney, we invited you and you came to, to speak at a Project Alliance presentation we made. So I know you'll give a very warm welcome to Dr. Englander. Good morning, everybody, uh, or I guess uh, good lunchtime. I, I apologize for uh, my uh, tardiness and, and being here today. Um, everybody, of course, is, is here today. You're not all out patrolling the roads, which may explain why they were the way they were. Uh, but uh, I'm here now in any case. And what I want to talk about, I'm going to talk for a little bit more than a minute, but I'm going to talk about um, some of the research that we've done. and. Uh, <clears throat> particularly some of the findings that we found this year which are uh, very interesting and have really demonstrated to us some of the problems uh, in some of the approaches that we've taken. Very briefly, for those of you who don't know who I am or what Mark is, I'm a professor at Bridgewater State College. I run a center there that brings services, research, and um, programs to Massachusetts in the areas of violence prevention, bullying prevention, and cyberbullying prevention. And we really focus on getting these resources. Uh, we do not sell them. We give them away. 
and uh, we are really focused on being a game changer and having Massachusetts be a leader and a smart leader in really um, using existing resources in higher education to help uh, K through 12 education and law enforcement do a better job around these issues. Um, this is our website and I just wanted to show it to you briefly because there are many resources on it that you may be able to use. There are resources designed specifically for professionals and ones for parents and uh, we have all kinds of programs, downloads. Our research is all posted there if you need statistics or you're interested in what's going on in cyberbullying. Uh, we are doing uh, at Mark a lot of the cutting edge research in cyberbullying right now, some of which I'm going to show you today. And, um, uh, schools uh, and other community groups go to our website and they just request services. It's basically run on a first come first serve basis and frankly I'm sure everyone here is aware that right now everyone in the Commonwealth is on the verge of hysteria around bullying and cyberbullying issues. I think that's a fair characterization. We're at the beginning of April and I wouldn't say that all of our programs are booked up for next year. But if your school is thinking and having meetings and debating about what you want to do, uh, if your intention is to go to our website and put in a request, my advice is don't dawdle because things are going very, very fast this year. And we're definitely um, hoping that we can increase our capacity, but that's not for sure. We have all kinds of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, other um, downloads. These are all free. Um, <clears throat> ones you may be particularly interested in is the Facebook problems download. Um, Facebook's privacy settings and their settings in general are difficult to navigate. They are not easy. Um, they are difficult. And you may have many instances where there is a problem on Facebook and you're advising somebody to block a user and you may not realize, for example, that you cannot block a user if they're not on your friends list. There are little tricks like that that are not clear in Facebook that are all on this download. And so, uh, you may want to take a look at it. Um, we also do have a guide for dealing with cyberbullying incidences. Um, <clears throat> the programs that we run try to be comprehensive. So when we go into a community, we try to work with community groups, the administration, the faculty, the students, the parents, and uh, everyone there. Frankly, we all know that that's the best way to effect change in the children that we're all dealing with, uh, to avoid them going into the juvenile system, which is, of course, the goal. Um, but having said that, it's, it's not always so easy. Um, we, the kids are the easiest part. The kids are the easiest part. The kids are always the easiest part. Uh, what we do with the kids is we take teenagers and we send out uh, college students who are trained in the center to go and work with those kids. It is a fantastic model. It works really, really well. Uh, and uh, it helps everyone. It helps the college kids and the grad students who are going to be going into these fields. It helps the kids in the schools. Um, and that's the easiest part. The hardest part is the parents. That's the hardest part. And uh, I was just at a parent event the other night where a mother got up and she said, I don't understand why you didn't force everyone in this district, every parent in this district, to be here tonight. And I said, well, you know, we have this thing called the Constitution and you can't, you know, uh, but we're trying to think outside the box. So we're trying to think of ways to get through to the community without going through K through 12 education. Uh, what we really need, frankly, is a massive public health campaign. That is what we really need. Not aimed at the kids, aimed at the parents for their role in all this. Um, however, uh, nobody seems to be interested in putting up 10 million bucks to do this. So it's not happening right now. So uh, the idea that we're working on right now with Children's Hospital is going through pediatricians. Pediatricians see all parents once a year. So if we could get pediatricians to talk to parents about their responsibility and what their children are doing in school and online, uh, that would be a big step forward. And so we're working, trying to think outside the box. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of our research, some of our field work, some of the things we're seeing online, and some of the challenges that we're all facing. As uh, the Attorney General pointed out, kids are very different today. This is absolutely true. They're very comfortable with technology. They are not particularly knowledgeable about it, but they are comfortable with it. And many parents uh, mistake these two issues. They're very accustomed to a constant flow of information, particularly teenagers today go through life in constant communication with each other. And this is the, this, for them, this is the norm. This is the way it is. 